Well, in our services today, we're going to be looking at the chapter that we read earlier, 2 Kings chapter 5. And this morning, we're principally going to be thinking about Naaman and about what we can learn from what happened to him in this story. Now, when I call it a story, we do need to be a bit careful because perhaps the first thing that jumps into our mind when we say a story is we think about a work of fiction or perhaps a fairy story. Now, this is not a work of fiction or a fairy story or some fable that's been recorded to teach us some lesson. This is history. This is something that actually happened. These events actually took place. But the reason that they're recorded here in the Bible is not simply to record them as history. Like everything else that is written in God's word, these events are recorded here because we can learn from them. Now, it's difficult to place the events of this chapter into an exact time frame. Whilst we know the time that Elisha lived and ministered, these few chapters in 2 Kings, from 2 Kings chapter 4 to 2 Kings chapter 8, give details of some of the miracles that Elisha performed. And they seem to be grouped together because of the subject matter. And so because of this, they might not be in strict chronological order. And in the chapter we're looking at this morning, the kings are simply referred to as the king of Aram and the king of Israel. We are not given any names. However, to some extent, the exact time frame we're looking at is not relevant. The important thing that we need to notice is the state of relations between the two countries at this time. Now, it would appear that at this time there was relative peace between these two nations, between Aram and Israel. But that was a temporary state of affairs. Israel and Aram had been, if not actually an all-out war, then certainly at very least in a state of conflict. We read in verse 2, Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. So troops from Aram had been sending raiding parties into Israel and taking Israelites back as slaves to their own land. And if you turn forward to the next chapter, we see that in the next chapter, we read in verse 8, now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. So around this time in history, the time that Elisha lived and ministered, the relationship between Israel and Aram was, well, should we say, rather volatile. And it seems improbable the king of Aram would have sent the commander of his army into Israel if they'd actually been in an active state of war. But it is clear that the relationship between these nations were not good. After all, the king of Israel thinks the king of Aram is trying to pick a fight with him by sending Naaman to him. Verse 8, why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. So the king of Israel thinks that when he sent this man to be cured of his leprosy, what the king of Aram knows is this isn't possible. And he's just trying to pick a fight and say, look, you failed to do this. So the events that we think about in this chapter are all the more remarkable. And Jesus himself notes this. In the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4, we read about Jesus' teaching in the synagogue at Nazareth. And as he responds to the unbelief of the congregation, he says to them, And there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So what can we learn from what happened to Naaman, the Aramean, the Syrian, a man who was, to all appearances, an enemy of God's people? Well, the first thing that we can see is that Naaman had a problem, a big problem. When we first meet him in verse 1, this might seem a bit unlikely. In many ways, his life is great. He's doing well in his chosen career of soldiering. He's risen through the ranks. He's done so well. He's become the commander of the whole army of a powerful nation. He was a great man in the sight of his master, the king of Aram. He was highly regarded. He's successful in battle, leading the troops of Aram against their enemies. And some of these victories were almost certainly against the people of Israel. Which makes it all the more surprising that when we read that it was through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Now I don't intend to go into all the implications of that this morning. But suffice it to say we should notice that the Lord was with him. 
And what a blessing that was to him, even if he was unaware of it at that time. And along the way, he had had opportunity to acquire wealth and possessions. He had servants. And amidst all this busy and rewarding life, he found time to settle down and get married. Surely he could have everything that he could want. His life was perfect. He had it all. A successful career. Recognition from the king himself. Riches and possessions. A wife and family. And then we reach that final part of verse 1. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now, to us, it may be difficult to understand the full impact of those words. And the word that is used here is actually a non-specific term, which is used for various diseases affecting the skin, not necessarily leprosy as we would recognise it today. However, that's not going to lessen the diagnosis. Because if people are unable to determine which skin disease it is, they were treated as the worst case, which was leprosy. Now, leprosy, or Hansen's disease, is a disease that affects the nerves and the respiratory tract and the skin and the eyes. And because of the way it affects the nerves, people that suffer from this lack the ability to feel pain. And they can feel, then have injuries. They can burn themselves or cut themselves without even being aware of it. And this can even lead to the loss of extremities. And as I said in the children's talk, up until the middle of the 20th century, leprosy was untreatable. This summer, my sister and her family were on holiday in the Greek island of Crete. And while they were there, they made a trip to a small nearby island called Spinalonga. Now, I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Apparently, it's famous due to the success of a novel called The Island. But in 1903, Spinalonga Island became a leper colony. When people were diagnosed with leprosy, they were sent to this island away from other people, so there was no danger of them affecting other people. And the leper colony on Spinalonga Island remained there until 1957. And although treatment was available for leprosy from the mid-1940s, it was only in 1982 that a cure was found. So we can see that in biblical times, leprosy would have been untreatable, the only solution would have been isolation. Lepers were kept away from other people so that they could not infect them. And we read in Leviticus 13, verses 45 and 46, how such people were to be regarded by the people of Israel. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean. As long as he has the infection, he remains unclean. He must live alone. He must live outside the camp. Now, Naaman was not an Israelite. He was an Aramean. However, there's no reason to believe the Arameans would not have behaved in a very similar sort of way, fearing this disease. Because this was the standard treatment up until 100 years ago. After all, who would want to be infected by such a loathsome disease? This man stood to lose everything. All that he had worked for for all those years, wiped out at a stroke. He would lose the respect of the people. He would lose his social standing, his possessions, his family, his wife. Everything would be taken away from him. And he would be doomed to live the rest of his life away from society. He was a valiant soldier. But he had leprosy. No matter how good a soldier he was, no matter how brave a soldier he was, here was an enemy that he couldn't fight, that he couldn't defeat. And each one of us here is like Naaman. We might not be in his exact circumstances, we might not be at the top of our profession or hobnobbing with royalty and aristocracy. And in fact, you might go, well, actually my circumstances are completely different to Naaman's. We might be struggling physically, emotionally, or financially. How then is it that I can say that we are all like Naaman? Well, each one of us here this morning has a big problem too. It isn't a skin disease. It isn't a physical illness. It is something that is far, far worse. It is something that the Bible calls sin. Sin is our failure to live up to the standards that God demands, 
Sin is setting ourselves up in the place of God, living according to our own desires. And when we think about living, this, living up to the standards that God requires, we can see how true it is. So often we fail to live up even to our own standards, don't we? That we would find it difficult to argue that we fail to live up to God's standards. And the Bible makes it very plain that this is a problem for each one of us. In Romans 3 and verse 23, we read, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But why is that a problem? Why does it matter if we sin and fall short of the glory of God? What are the implications of this? Well, again, we can find the answer in the book of Romans, this time in chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death. Well, what does this mean? After all, we're all going to die, aren't we? But what the writer is speaking of there is not physical death. He is talking of what is going to happen for eternity. The Bible makes it clear that those who do not do something about their sins will be punished for eternity. And moreover, there is no unfairness or unjustness in this because they're simply reaping the rewards for what they've done. How does that verse phrase it? The wages of sin. The just reward for what we've done. And at a human level, to some extent, we can understand this, can't we? Even if at times we are reluctant to apply it to ourselves. A few years ago, there was a string of high-profile court cases involving celebrities. And almost everyone would say that if they are guilty of these things that they're accused of, then they deserve to be punished. And in some cases, there are even complaints from the public that the courts weren't severe enough. Now, suppose the lawyer for one of these men were to stand up and say they didn't deserve to be punished. They admit that their client has done these terrible things that they've been accused of. But really, the judge needs to take into account the bigger picture. Their client has enriched people's lives. He's raised millions of pounds for charity. He's done some really good things that have helped others. Surely that's got to outweigh the bad things that he's done. Well, can you imagine the public outcry if the judge listened to those arguments and set the man free? And yet, many people are unable to apply that same criteria to themselves. They can admit that they do things that are wrong, but they would point the finger at somebody else and say, well, look at them, they're far worse than me. They've done worse things than me. I'm not really that bad in comparison to other people. But that is to miss the point. What we are talking about here is justice. What other people have or haven't done is irrelevant. The good things that you have or haven't done or think you've done are irrelevant. They are not the things that you are facing judgment for. Can you say that you have lived up to God's standards? Well, if you think you can, then you are only fooling yourself. We cannot hope to achieve that standard that is demanded by God because that standard is complete obedience to his holy law. And because of this, we deserve to be punished and to go to hell. That is the fair reward, the just punishment for what we have done. That is the wages that we are owed. Naaman had a big problem, but so do we. So what was Naaman able to do about his problem? Well, the case seemed hopeless, didn't it? How can he deal with this disease? Everyone knows it's incurable. Well, we read in verses 2 and 3 of someone who could help him. Now, bands from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. So, Here at last is some hope. Here is a lead. Naaman could go to the prophet who's in Samaria and he would be cured of his leprosy. And maybe something similar has happened to you and that is why you are here this morning. You have already realised that there is a problem with your life. You have this big problem. Your conscience has told you that your life isn't perfect, that you do things wrong, that one day there will be eternal consequences for it. And perhaps somehow you've come to hear that there is a solution to your problem. Maybe through something you've read or somebody that you've talked to. And you're here this morning to find out how you can deal with this problem, how you can have peace. 
But as we think about things, we need to be aware that the solution to our problem doesn't always take the form that we think it should. And this is the lesson that Naaman was going to learn, and the lesson that we too should learn from him. And we see that Naaman went to see the prophet. In verses 9 and 10, we read of how Naaman was to be healed. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. Naaman now knew how he could be cured. Surely he's going to be delighted by that. Think of the alternative, living in isolation, losing everything. He has a solution, he can be cured. What's his response? We read in verses 11 to 13. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. Wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, the prophet had told you to do some great thing. Would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? Naaman had another problem. Not only did he have leprosy, but he was also proud. You might argue, I suppose, that you could say Naaman had every right to be proud. After all, look at all that he has achieved, his wealth, his position in society. But his pride was standing in the way of his healing. This man was desperate to be healed, to be cured, but he didn't want to humble himself. And we can have the same problem. There is a way which we can be saved from our sin. We read in the Gospel of John chapter 3, verse 16, which is a very well-known verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Or if we read the full verse in Romans chapter 6, which I quoted earlier, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. God sent his only son into this world to deal with our sin, to take the punishment for our sin. So how does this work? How does it to solve our problem of sin? Well, for those that are sports fans here, you'll be very familiar with the concept of a substitute. If you follow games such as a football or rugby, You'll know that sometimes if a player is tired or injured or perhaps just isn't even playing well, the manager might decide to put on a substitute. There is someone who can come on in their place. And in the recent Rugby World Cup, there was much talk about the choice of substitutes for some of the teams. Had the manager made a wise decision in his choice of substitutes, were they the right men to come on? Well, Jesus Christ came into this world to be a substitute for each one of us. Because we are sinners, we deserve to be punished. But when Jesus died on the cross, he was the substitute for us. And he was the only possible substitute. As he died on the cross, he took the punishment for our sins. He took our place. And even better than that, it's a two-way thing. As he took our sins... He also took his righteousness and gave it to us. So how can we ensure that Jesus Christ is our substitute, that the problem of our sin has been dealt with? We read in the book of Acts of a man who asked exactly that question. Acts chapter 16, verses 29 to 31. The jailer called for lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. That is the message that those apostles had for the Philippian jailer and that is God's message still for you today. If you are truly sorry for your sin and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ that he took the punishment for your sins when he died on the cross, then you will be saved. Isn't that fantastic? There is nothing that we ourselves can do, 
but God has given us this way of salvation. But maybe you too have this problem of pride that Naaman had. Your pride stands in the way of you accepting this. And this pride can take a number of forms. Perhaps you are too proud to admit even that you have a problem. You can admit that you do not live a perfect life, but there are others far worse than you. In your pride, you cannot accept that you are not and cannot be good enough for God. Maybe in your pride, you think you can contribute to some of your salvation. If you go to the right places, do the right things, then surely that should be enough. Surely God will be pleased with you if you go to church every week or read your Bible or give to the poor. Now, don't get me wrong, all those are good things to do. But if they're not done for the right reasons, they will not please God. And they do not contribute towards your salvation. If in your pride you believe that these things will help you become right with God, then you are mistaken. (coughs) Repent of your pride. Come humbly before God, confessing that you are a sinner, that you are unable to live your life to please him, that you deserve to be punished for the things that you have done. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Know that when he died on the cross, he took that punishment that should have been yours. So how can we be so sure that this is the case? What is the proof of it? Well, let us return to the story of Naaman, 2 Kings 5, verse 14. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. When Naaman was obedient to what he had been told to do, then he was healed. In fact, better even than just healed, his flesh became clean like that of a young boy. Not only had his leprosy gone, but he looked years younger. So how and why was Naaman healed? Was it there were some peculiar properties in the waters of the River Jordan? Was there some minerals in there or something? Well, look at Naaman's initial reaction to the instructions. Are not Abana and Farpa, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the rivers of Israel? Well, even allowing for a certain amount of patriotic pride, he could well have been right. How did dipping himself in the River Jordan help him? Well, the instructions that Elisha gave him came from God. Elisha was a messenger of God. So when Naaman bathed himself seven times in the River Jordan, he was being obedient to the word of God. It was God who healed him when he was obedient. And that was how his problem was dealt with. And this is the same God that we worship here today. Just as Naaman was healed when he was obedient to God, we can be sure that the problem of our sin will be dealt with if we are obedient to God. And we are assured of this in the Bible. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess ourselves, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let me repeat that. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Do not let your pride or anything else hinder you from coming to God and doing just that. Come before him and confess your sin. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. How can we be so sure? Because we have promises written by God in his word. In Acts chapter 2, the apostle Peter quotes the prophet Joel and applies his words to the time that we live in. And he assures us that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I'd like to close by thinking briefly of all that God did for Naaman. When looking at this chapter, I was very much brought to think of the words of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, where he describes God as him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And isn't that the experience that Naaman had of God in this chapter? Even before he was aware of God's working in his life, Naaman was being blessed by God. Through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram. Although he had a big problem in his life, God had provided him with someone who was able to point him in the right direction where he could get a solution. God provided that servant girl 
who was able to tell him about the prophet. Through the prophet, God was able to tell him how he could be healed. And ultimately, it was God who gave him the faith to obey those instructions. And when he obeyed, God was faithful and healed him. But more than that, more than just healing, his flesh became clean like that of a young boy. He looked better than he had any right to at his age. So God had done plenty for Naaman. But actually, we haven't touched upon the most important, the most wonderful, the most glorious thing that God had done for Naaman. Because not only did God deal with Naaman's physical problem, he dealt with his biggest problem of all, his standing before God. Verse 15. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. He had come to know and to trust the one true living God, and he was determined to follow him. We see this again in verse 17 where he says to Elisha, Your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other God but the Lord. God did for Naaman more than he asked or could imagine. And if you're a Christian here this morning, then remember to be thankful to God for the way that he has blessed you. When we think about what God did for Naaman, how he healed him both physically and spiritually, it should cause us once again to give thanks to God for his goodness towards us. If you're a Christian, your standing before God is an amazing thing. He was prepared to send his own son to die for you. How can we take that lightly? But do you realise just how much he has done for you? Before the fall, our first parents, Adam and Eve, enjoyed communion with God. And that was a wonderful thing. But through the sacrifice of Christ, God has given us something even better. Not only has our relationship with God been restored, but we are told that we are heirs of God. We have an inheritance kept for us in heaven that can never perish, spoil or fade. Not only are we saved, but we stand to gain more than we have ever lost or will ever lose in this life. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, then recognise that God has greatly blessed you. There are many blessings that are common to all men that you may not see as coming from God. We have much to be thankful for in this country. Notwithstanding what we've seen in some places in this past week, generally we do not have to suffer from extremes of weather. Certainly we do not have to worry about typhoons or hurricanes or tsunamis. And even though it may be a struggle for some people in these times, we do have roofs over our heads, clothes to wear and food to eat. God has materially blessed us, certainly compared to many others in many other countries. God has blessed you in that you are here this morning. Just as Naaman's servant girl was a blessing to him by directing him to the prophet and ultimately to God, so you have been blessed by someone or something that has prompted you to come along this morning. You have had an opportunity to hear the word of God. And I pray that God has further blessed you by enabling you to understand what has been said here. But if you are not a Christian here this morning, Know that God desires to bless you further. He wants to set you free from your sins and to give you eternal life. And if you're not a Christian here this morning, then turn to him now. Come to him in prayer, confessing your sin and your need of a saviour. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. As Naaman departed, Elisha's final words to him were, Go in peace. Can that be said to you this morning? Has your problem of sin been dealt with? Are you at peace with God?